Hamon Rai, Chapter 7 There were continual fights. The teachers didn't seem to know anything about them, and there was always trouble when it rained. Any boy who brought an umbrella to school or a raincoat was singled out. Most of our parents were too poor to buy us such things, and when they did, we hid them in the bushes. Anybody seen carrying an umbrella wearing a raincoat was considered a sissy. They are beaten after school. David's mother had him carry an umbrella whenever it was the least bit cloudy. There were two recess periods. The first graders gathered at their own baseball diamond, and the teams were chosen. David and I stood together. It was always the same. I was chosen next to last, and David was chosen last, so we always played on different teams. David was worse than I was. With his crossed eyes, he couldn't even see the ball. I needed lots of practice. I had never played with the kids in the neighborhood. I didn't know how to catch a ball or how to hit one. But I wanted to. I liked it. David was afraid of the ball. I wasn't. I swung hard. I swung harder than anybody, but I could never hit the ball. I always struck out. Once I fouled a ball off. That felt good. Another time I drew a walk. When I got to first, the first baseman said, That's the only way you'll ever get here. I stood and looked at him. He was chewing gum and he had long black hairs coming out of his nostrils. His hair was thick with Vaseline. He wore a perpetual sneer. What are you looking at? He asked me. I didn't know what to say. I wasn't used to conversation. The guys say you're crazy, he told me. But you don't scare me. I'll be waiting for you after school someday. I kept looking at him. He had a terrible face. Then the pitcher wound up and I broke for second. I ran like crazy and slid into second. The ball arrived late. The tag was late. You're out, screamed the boy as turn was to the umpire. I got up, not believing it. I said, you're out, the umpire screamed. Then I knew I was not accepted. David and I were not accepted. The others wanted me out because I was supposed to be out. They knew David and I were friends. It was because of David that I wasn't wanted. As I walked off the diamond, I saw David playing third base in his knickers. His blue and yellow stockings followed down around his feet. Why had he chosen me? I was a marked man. That afternoon, after school, I quickly left class and walked home alone, without David. I didn't want to watch him beaten again by our classmates or by his mother. I didn't want to listen to his sad violin. But the next day at lunchtime, when he sat down next to me, I ate his potato chips. My day came. I was tall and I felt very powerful at the plate. I couldn't believe that I was as bad as they wished me to be. I swung wildly but with force. I knew it was strong and maybe, they, like they said, crazy. But I had this feeling inside me that something real was there. Just hardened shit, maybe. But that was more than they had. I was up at bat. Hey, it's the strikeout king, Mr. Windmill. The ball arrived. I swung and I felt the bat connect like I wanted it to do for so long. The ball went up, up, up and high into left field. Way over the left fielder's head. His name was Don Brubaker, and he stood and watched it fly over his head. It looked like it was never going to come down. Then Brubaker started running out to the ball. He wanted to throw me out. He would never do it. The ball landed and rolled onto a dime where some fifth graders were playing. I ran slowly to first, hit the bag, looked the guy in first, ran slowly to second, touched it, ran to third where David stood, ignored him, tagged third, and walked to home plate. Never such a day. Never such a home run by a first grader. As I stepped in home blade, I heard one of the players, Irving Bone, say to the team captain, Stanley Greenberg, Let's put him on the regular team. The regular team played teams for other schools. No, says Stanley Greenberg. Stanley was right. I never hit another home run. I struck out most of the time. But they always remember that home run, and while they still hated me, it was a better kind of hatred. Like, they weren't quite sure why. Football season was worse. We played touch football. I couldn't catch the football or throw it, but I got into one game. When the runner came through, I grabbed him by the shirt collar and threw him on the ground. When he started to get up, I kicked him. I didn't like him. He was the first baseman with Vaseline in his hair and the hair in his nostrils. Stanley Greenberg came over. He was larger than any of us. He could have killed me if he wanted to. He was our leader. Whatever he said, that was it. He told me, you don't understand the rules. No more football for you. I was moved into volleyball. I played volleyball with David and the others. It wasn't any good. They yelled and screamed and got excited, but the others were playing football. I wanted to play football. All I needed was a little practice. Volleyball was shameful. Girls played volleyball. After a while, I wouldn't play. I just stood in the center of the field where nobody was playing. I was the only one who would not play anything. I stood there each day and waited through the two recess sessions until they were over. One day, while I was standing there, more trouble came. A football sailed from high behind me and hit me on the head. It knocked me to the ground. I was very dizzy. I stood around snickering and laughing. Oh, look, Henry fainted. Henry fainted like a lady. Oh, look at Henry. I got up while the sun spun around. Then it stood still. The sky moved closer and flattened out. It was like being in a cage. They stood around me, faces, noses, mouths, and eyes. Because they were taunting me, I thought they had deliberately hit me with the football. It was unfair. Who kicked that ball, I asked. You want to know who kicked the ball? Y yes. What are you going to do when you find out? I didn't answer. 
It was Billy Shirell, somebody said. Billy was a round fat boy, really nice than most, but he was one of them. I began walking toward Billy. He stood there. When I got close, he swung. I almost didn't feel it. I hit him behind his left ear, and when he grabbed his ear, I hit him in the stomach. He fell to the ground. He stayed down. Get up and fight him, Billy, said Stanley Greenberg. Stanley lifted Billy up and pushed him toward me. I punched Billy in the mouth, and he grabbed his mouth with both hands. Okay, said Stanley. I'll take his place. The boys cheered. I decided to run. I didn't want to die. Then a teacher came up. What's going on here? It was Mr. Hall. Henry picked on Billy, said Stanley Greenberg. Is that right, boys? asked Mr. Hall. Yes, they said. Mr. Hall took me by the ear all the way to the principal's office. He pushed me into a chair in front of an empty desk and then knocked on the principal's door. He was in there for some time. When he came out, he left without looking at me. He sat there five or ten minutes before the principal came out and sat behind the desk. He was a very dignified man with a mass of white hair and a blue bow tie. He looked like a real gentleman. His name was Mr. Knox. Mr. Knox folded his hands and looked at me without speaking. When he did that, I was not so sure that he was a gentleman. He seemed to want to humble me, treat me like the others. Well, he said at last, tell me what happened. Nothing happened. You hurt that boy, Billy Shirill. His parents are going to want to know why. I didn't answer. Do you think you can take matters into your own hands when something happens you don't like? No. Then why did you do it? I didn't answer. Do you think you're better than most people? No. Mr. Knox sat there. He had a long letter opener, and he slid it back and forth on the green felt padding in the desk. He had a large bottle of green ink on his desk and a pen holder with four pens. I wondered if he would beat me. Then why did you do what you did? I didn't answer. Mr. Knox slid the letter opener back and forth. The phone rang. He picked it up. Hello? Oh, Mrs. Kirby? He what? What? Listen, can't you administer the discipline? I'm busy now. All right, I'll phone you when I'm done with this one. He hung up. He brushed his fine white hair back out of his eyes with one hand and looked at me. Why do you cause me all this trouble? I didn't answer him. You think you're tough, huh? I kept silent. Tough kid, huh? There's a fly circling Mr. Knox's desk. It hovered over his green ink bottle. Then it landed on the black cap of the ink bottle and sat there rubbing its wings. Okay, kid, you're tough and I'm tough. Let's shake hands on that. I didn't think I was tough, so I didn't give him my hand. Come on, give me your hand. I stretched my hand out and he tucked and began shaking it. Then he stopped shaking it and looked at me. He had clear blue eyes, lighter than the blue of his bow tie. His eyes were almost beautiful. He kept looking at me and holding my hand. His grip began to tighten. I want to congratulate you for being a tough guy. His grip tightened some more. Do you think I'm a tough guy? I didn't answer. He crushed the bones of my fingers together. I could feel the bone of each finger cutting like a blade into the flesh of the finger next to it. Shots of red flashed before my eyes. Do you think I'm a tough guy? He asked. I'll kill you, I said. You'll what? Mr. Nix tightened his grip. He had a hand like a vice. I could see every pore in his face. Tough guys don't scream, do they? I couldn't look at his face anymore. Put my face down the desk. Am I a tough guy? Asked Mr. Knox. He squeezed harder. I had to scream, but I kept as quiet as possible so no one in the class could hear me. Now, am I a tough guy? I waited. I hated to say it. Then I said, yes. Mr. Knox let go of my hand. I was afraid to look at it. I let it hang by my side. I noticed that the fly was gone. I thought, it's not so bad to be a fly. Mr. Knox was writing on a piece of paper. Now, Henry, I'm writing a little note to your parents and want you to deliver it to them. And you will deliver it to them, won't you? Yes. He folded the note into an envelope and handed it to me. The envelope was sealed, and I had no desire to open it.